I would appreciate it if you would open your Bible to the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 14. Romans, chapter 14. I'm going to draw attention to five verses, five verses that have to do with judgment, with judgment in Romans 14. Now the occasion that brought about this writing by the Apostle Paul was the fact that there were problems in the minds of people. Problems in the minds of people. They were yielding to their own personal desires and making judgment upon their neighbor Christians. Two matters particularly one having to do with special days about which some felt very keenly, the other having to do with diet, a matter that disturbed some of them. And so he's cautioning them to be kind, to be loving, to be considerate, and above all, not to sit in judgment on their brothers in such matters. But the theme that you and I will be dealing with is not that of days and diets, but rather the very subject itself, judging the brother. And I'd like to have you First of all, follow along as I read these few verses. Now that you know the context, you'll know the reason why I do not read the whole chapter. Verse 4 of Romans 14. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. You see what he's getting at right away. It's the subject of judging, not just a matter of diets and days, but the very subject itself is very important. First of all, who are you? Who are you? To set yourself up in a position to judge another. You know, in a court, a judge must not be involved in the case, whether it be by the state or by a citizen, or a dispute between citizens. He must be above it. He must not be a part of it, because then he would be charged with conflict of interest. He's got to be above it, above this, this uh, controversy, whatever it might be. Now, you get the push of this when you realize the Apostle Paul is saying, who are you as a Christian, saved by grace, to put yourself up, put yourself up above a situation where you don't know all the details, you don't know all the elements involved in that person's decision. You don't know what pressures he's been under. You don't know his background. You don't know that he may be squeamish about certain things. Who are you to set yourself up to judge the brother? Because you're judging him by your own bias. Your own flesh is the judge. And of course that's wrong as we've seen. Now in verse 10. 
But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why do you do it? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. We can't take God's place. One of the things that we have to learn in Christian service and it's something that I had to learn early in my ministry. And that is no two people are alike, not even identical twins. We're all different. We're all different. And one of the most foolish things that any leader could do is to try to mold everybody to exactly his way of thinking and doing things. And we must allow for this difference amongst God's people. We're not talking now about uh, wrong doctrine or immoral life or anything like that. Please understand that. We're talking about the likes and the dislikes and the preferences and how we see another person live and how we evaluate that. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. Every one of us. You know, that takes away an awful lot of uh, desire to sit in judgment on somebody else. He doesn't do it the way I think it ought to be done. He doesn't wear what I think he ought to wear and all that, all those things. Why, it, it takes us away from all of that. We're all going to stand, every one of us, before God's judgment. And one thing we can be assured of, that if we've been subjected to unwise criticism or evaluation, that God is able to hold us up and to make us stand. Now in verse 11, for it is written, and he goes back to the Old Testament now, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God not to each other not obligated to the whims and the likes and dislikes of fellow Christians but bow before the almighty himself and shall confess to God open up unto him then in verse 12 so then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You know, that takes away a lot of that yen for judging somebody else. Then in verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. You see, they've been doing it. Paul probably felt it within himself because he includes himself in there. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. Passing judgment without knowing all that can be known about a situation is evil to the best of our knowledge the Anglo-American jurisprudence requires that where there is such a dispute whether it's the law after an individual citizen or whether it's a matter of two citizens in dispute that it is up to each party to bring in all of the evidence it possibly can so that uh, all that can be brought before, be it judge or jury, will be made known. You understand that how easy it is for us to pass judgment on somebody else when we don't know all the details? We don't know what they went through? And what a shame it is then to pass a sentence of contempt or severe criticism when we didn't know. 
Perhaps we saw them bend under a strain, but we had no idea how great that strain was. And even in the area of days and diets, there were people under pressure. Don't forget that. So he reminds each one, look, we're all going to stand before God someday. And we're going to confess before him. It's all going to be open then. And it's all open to him now. So as Paul writes earlier in the chapter, judge nothing before the time. Can we take this home and remember it? Have you found yourself guilty sometimes of passing judgment on a fellow believer? What they wore, how they walked, so in any number of things which just didn't fit your idea of what they ought to be. Well, remember, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God, everyone. And we're going to confess before him. And in humility, because every knee shall bow. Now if you've been on the other end, if you've been on the other end, where you've been judged, unjustly, unfairly, because somebody didn't know the facts, somebody didn't understand, then remember the first verse we read, to his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, God is able to make him stand. So take courage. You know we're at this time of year when people get weary. Have you any idea how weary a person can get from thinking maybe you remember your school days and you were in school and you could become exhausted not by running not by digging ditches not by playing football or basketball you quickly respond from that but just this studying and cramming and trying to think things through and meeting a deadline it's one of the most exhausting things there is. I remember early in my ministry, we had very few people at that time who were involved in what you would call mental tasks. Their daily work was largely uh, the tasks that required uh, labor in the physical sense. And therefore they couldn't understand they couldn't understand that anyone could ever get tired of uh, reading or studying. It was beyond their concept. And I want to mention this now because, not because we're 100 years old. I don't want to forget that either. But the fact that we have people in this congregation who not as a part of their daily living are earning a living, but their giving of themselves, as we mentioned earlier today, in a ministry. A ministry that has a requirement. And there is a pressure that's emotional. And you know, after they've had eight, nine, ten months of this, they become as exhausted as human beings can become. No question about it. And I, it may be that our climate has something to do with it. But I want everyone to understand so I don't get judged unfairly. That I fully understand why teachers and singers and others who've had to think and prepare in addition to their daily work suddenly, not suddenly, but gradually run out of steam. Oh, somebody says, but the devil never quits. No, but he doesn't have a body such as we have either, does he? And I want you people who minister 
especially who minister the word in word and in song, that at least the pastor understands that you do become tired. And you become to the come to the place where you you, you just can't you, you, you're, you're almost afraid to make a commitment to anything because you're mentally tired. And no one has ever been able to measure that. They can measure energy and its use, but they cannot measure emotional and mental exhaustion. Now we've had people critical coming to this church not knowing too much about what was going on not knowing how many people were involved in these many ministries during the day and on Sunday and Friday nights and young people and, 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 and rehearsing and all of that had no idea of it and then they find that we go on summer schedule and they make the judgment and they have made the judgment in fact, I had, or did have, I threw it away some time ago, uh, a stinging letter that here you call yourself the Church of the Open Bible and, and you don't have this and you don't have that. They do not understand. I hope I'm helping you to see the judgment the Apostle Paul is talking about, where people pass judgment without knowing the circumstances without knowing the details without knowing what they're doing I'm going to tell you a story out of my own experience this happened some years ago after a a midweek service I met with the board of deacons of that day we had a number of things to discuss and to consider and they were heavy matters of course they involved the future of the little church and uh, I had been busy during the day had been and conducted the evening service that in that midweek service and then that deacon's meeting lasted until little after midnight before we could go home. I was tired, I hadn't had any supper, and so a little after midnight I sat down at the table to try to relax and have a snack. The telephone rang. A lady called and asked if I could be of help. There was a party in another town, a man and his wife, who were alcoholics, and things were very, very bad. And she said that she had, she was being treated, her, this lady who called me was being treated for something by a doctor in this area, and when she had told him that she had friends who were alcoholics, that doctor told her that she ought to get in touch with Pastor Helgerson. He could help people like that. So here it is, about one o'clock in the morning, and I haven't had any sleep now, and asked, would I go and see these people? I said I would. So I jotted down the address to go to a town with which I was not very familiar, not very far from here, however. And after a while, I, I found the place, and I went to the house. The lady had recently been taken away to uh, um, some sort of a, uh, asylum where some of the wealthier people go to get dried out from their alcoholism. The husband was a uh, very prominent Bostonian uh, involved in one of the large banks in Boston. And uh, he himself was an alcoholic. And when 
He had to allow his wife to be taken to a hospital. He became so distraught that he decided he would have to drink. And of course he went very, very bad. Now they had a neighbor. And that neighbor had been told that I was coming. She was waiting for me. And she said, I'm trying to do what I can here in the house. But she said, I cannot stay with him. We're afraid that he'll hurt himself or commit suicide or something. And she said, my husband, she told me where her husband was working. And, and, and she said, he won't be home until the early morning hours, if then, because he was working. Actually, he was working in Connecticut for the government. And she said, I've got two children at home, and I've got to get home and be with them. I can't leave them very long without uh, a mother or an adult in the house. So I said, well, get all the coffee you can going, get a big pot of coffee before you leave, and then I'll take over from there. So I tried to get him to drink coffee. The lady left, of course and relieved that now a man had come upon the scene to try to help this fellow. I need not describe his physical wretchedness. Uh, I went into the kitchen and there were empty beer cans all over the place. You had to be careful where you walked. They'd filled one basket and filled another hamper and, and, and all of this. It was sad. And when I learned more about the situation later on, the position that that man held. And what a tragedy. Of course, I tried to say a word now and then about the Lord Jesus, but he was in a bad, bad state. And I tried to get him to drink coffee and, and try to sober him a little bit because I wanted to do something. What could I do? So I called a friend of mine who was in Alcoholics Anonymous, a professional man in whom I had confidence, and he had told me that this is how they operate, that they are willing to be called any time, night or day. And I thought, I wonder how many Christians are like that. And uh, so I called him, and it didn't take very long before he answered the phone. And I told him my problem, and he said, well, I know a place where uh, he can go. I said, how am I going to get him there? Oh, he said, uh, I'll call them. I'll give them the address. And they'll come and get him. So he said, give me a central point in that town. So, uh, something they can easily find. And then... You get him that far, and they'll come and pick him up. They did. It took a long while. I, you know, when you're waiting for somebody like that to come, and you want to get this man off your hands, and you try to get him dressed so that he can go. <clears throat> I had to tie his shoelaces and things like that for him. But he didn't want to go. No, sir. So... It looked as though he was going to give me a struggle. And I thought, well, if that happens, I'll have to call them to come to the address, not to some a crossroad. And uh, yes, he was a little difficult. But finally, he consented to go in my car. I got him that far. And then I drove to the place where we were going to meet these people. And we did. We waited. And I kept talking to him. No more coffee now for a while. We didn't have that with us. And pretty soon the car came. Just an ordinary uh, car, no, nothing, no ambulance or anything like that. And then he started to be real rough. And so those fellows took over. They knew just how to handle him. They got him into their car and they drove off to that uh, hospital. It's not a hospital. It's a rest home where people of some means go uh, to get <clears throat> to get help it was not the hospital where his 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 wife was located i drove home when i got home 
It was half past five in the morning. I hadn't slept since the previous night. And, uh, and you, you know, you're not, then you're not sleepy. You're just sick awake. And I thought, what can I do to help these people? The wife is in one hospital, the man is in another now, and they'll be in there for at least a, a week or ten days or more, and the house is a mess. So I waited a while, trying to think what to do. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the Lord put it upon my mind to call a lady that I knew would be up at six o'clock in the morning. And I called this lady and I explained the situation. And I said, will you go with me and we'll go over to that town, we'll go into that house and we'll work together to clean up that place. I'll do work for what a man is supposed to do and you do what you can. And she said she would very, very graciously. So we drove over. It was about a half hour ride. And I don't know just what time of day we got there. It was, it was probably close to eight o'clock before we got organized. And she gathered all the uh, linen that had to be washed. And uh, so uh, she could take care of the laundry. And then she put, uh, there were a lot of uh, sheets and pillowcases and so forth in the closet so she could make up the beds and have everything nice and clean and I gathered up all the whiskey bottles and beer cans and all of that and put it in a big trash basket uh, out and back and we were really pretty busy well I'm going to shorten that story by telling you eventually I got home <clears throat> and you know it was after noon when I got home and I didn't feel like eating I was very very tired and of course my wife had been concerned all of this time where I was and what I was doing it was a beautiful day it turned out to be it was in June and I decided that I would go out in the backyard And I had a little radio, and I brought that out, and I turned it on to a ball game, and I stretched out on the grass to listen to the ball game that began at two o'clock in the afternoon in those days. And I hadn't been lying there very long, stretched out, it was warm, beautiful, and I dropped off to sleep. A lady from the church, however, was visiting somebody on that street. I lived on Arlington Road at that time. And when she came back by the pastor's house, she thought she ought to maybe stop in and say hello. And so she went to the back door. And what did she see? In the first place, I was wicked having a ball game on. <laughs> and then I was, of course, just goofing off. Well, it didn't take me very long, you know, get to get a shirt on and so forth and went in, visited, and so forth. You know, I was surprised. I never thought it would happen. I don't think she intended to really be malicious. But she shared that with a lot of people. That was a big thing. See, the minister lives in a goldfish bowl, as you know that. And unless he's very, very careful with people are going to find out everything and you know it hurt that church it hurt that testimony more than it hurt me 
They didn't know the details which I've given to you. How easy to jump at a conclusion, you see? So there's something more important than just days and diets, isn't it? It's just the horrible thing of sitting in judgment on another believer because for some reason we don't interpret what he says or what he does or how he dresses or how she walks as we should because we want everyone to conform to our pattern or our idea. People have asked me to share from time to time during these days some of those things out of the past from which we can learn and we ought to learn from the past, don't you think? And I wish that everyone here, I wish if all were here tonight, I wish everyone here would make it a point right now to say to the Lord, Lord save me from flesh judgment. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we confess to Thee that so often we jump at conclusions and we look at things from our own perspective alone and knowing so little about what others are going through. We see struggles and problems and we think how easily they could be solved only if they would do what we think they ought to do. And we confess that to thee, our Father. It keeps coming up again and again. But we don't want it to become a pattern. We don't want it to become common in the Church of the Open Bible. Father, help all of us to recognize this in ourselves. For it's a common failing. We all have been guilty of this at one time or in another. Now we pray that these thoughts, so very practical and down to earth and right where every one of us lives, will be so clear to us that we'll be very, very careful how we judge if we judge at all. Now, Father, there may be somebody here tonight who has a wrong concept of what it is to be a Christian because he's been looking at Christian failures. Lord, we pray that such a one might have his eyes open to see what the real thing is and may we all provide it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.